Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start by asking you whether or not, or how many of you, as you were considering that situation or watching them perform, how many of you in the back of your mind or maybe even in the front of your mind had issues either for yourself or for the performers of physical safety? Yeah, great. Because I'd like you to entertain the idea that physical safety, whether it's for our children, for ourselves, for the performers, is fundamentally tied to issues of social safety. And if you don't know what I mean by that, I hope by the end of this talk that you do have some idea about that because I'd like to argue and give you uh, a, an, and invite you to understand how physical safety is connected to the social safety nets that we create in our community. But I wanna start by challenging you, okay? Here are pictures, pictures of our sweet American boys. But some of these boys ended up not so sweet. I want you to take a minute or two to see if you can discriminate between two sets of boys. Some of these boys fell at the victims of rampage shooters, and others are the perpetrators themselves. Take a minute, look at these boys. Can you pick out the ones who are shooters and the ones who are victims? Now, all of these are public access photos, so I'm sure there may be one or two of you um, that can pick out maybe one or two of the shooters looking familiar from all the news coverage. But I'm wondering how many of you can pick out all the shooters and discriminate them for the, from the victims. Okay. All right, I'm not gonna give you too much time. Okay, so how well did you do? The grays, the, the people that are grayed out are the boys who were lost to rampage shootings in the United States. And the the boys that remain in colored photos, those are the boys who became the shooters, who became the men who uh, carried out just heinous acts of violence in public places in America, mostly in schools, but also in other public places like movie theaters, if you remember the, uh, the uh, Aurora, Colorado case. So the su fundamental question becomes, what is it that changed these boys that you may or may not been have been able to pick out from the other boys into these boys, these boys who perpetrated mass murder, okay? Look at the change even in their physical countenance in these pictures. How did that happen? And I wanna start out by suggesting that if we look at a case, a recent case, um, that we might get some sense of why it is that this happens and getting some sense of how it is that we might stop this and keep our children and ourselves safe. Now, as Americans, we tend to think in very individualistic terms. So we want to get inside the head of these boys. What was wrong with these boys? Who were these boys? Well, guess what? We know the answer to that, right? We know the answer to that because as we look at these, uh, at, after Columbine, the um, National Academy of Sciences commissioned a report and they sent sociologists out into places where these had occurred and they found out some very important things. They found out that these boys were boys who had perceptions of themselves as extremely marginal. Okay, now that's important. There are two words there that are important, perception and marginal. Because these weren't boys who were loners. These were boys who tried over and over and over again to belong. To belong to groups in their high schools, to belong to groups in their colleges, to belong to their family in a closer way, and yet they experienced, they were constantly rebuffed. There were also boys who had a great deal of individual vulnerability to this kind of rejection. They took this hard. All of us remember high school, therefore all of us remember rejection, right? And so there was something about these boys that made them particularly vulnerable to these kinds of attempted interactions with other people. They also bought into cultural scripts of the masculine exit. So when we talk about the idea of, you know, 
it's better to burn out than to fade away. Think about Bruce Willis movies, think for an older generation, think about John Wayne movies, right? They had bought into this idea that they would be remembered if they engaged in a spectacular event. And of course, the last thing is they talk about are the means. They had the means to accomplish these kinds of rampage activities. So I don't know if that answers the question. And I, what I want to do is talk about the policy response that we tend to have toward these kinds of mass events in the United States. And I want to do, I want to do that through looking at the latest school tragedy. And that is the one that occurred on April 9th of this year um, in Murraysville, Pennsylvania. There is the shooter, and well, it wasn't a shooter. That's the first hint. Okay, there is the perpetrator. Okay, Alex Rybal. And the two things that always come up on uh, public policy response, I want to talk about and work through why I think they're an insufficient response to trying to stop these kinds of rampage events. The first issue that's brought up is always mental illness. Okay, now. The studies indicate that about half of these boys may have had a mental health, a diagnosable mental health problem, but the other half or the other third did not, okay? I, they were clearly all troubled young men. But there's a difference between saying that they had a mental illness and saying that they were troubled. And I think Americans have a hard time of making that distinction because in the United States, when anything heinous happens, we tend to label that as sick, okay? But in this case, we see the reflection of this public issue, um, both sides. So first we have the prosecutor who said, no, you know, this person might have a mental health problem, right? And in every case, when something happens in the United States, they bring up the idea of mental illness. As somebody who studied mental illness for 30 years now, I get very concerned every time something like this happens because I know that they're going to raise the specter of mental illness. They never tell us in the end whether or not they did or did not have a mental illness, treated or untreated mental illness, but yet raising the specter already does the damage. However, in this case with Alex, we also see his lawyer coming out immediately and saying, look, this was not a loner or a weirdo. He had friends, good grades, he wasn't bullied, he had no history of mental problems, and he didn't use drugs. So I wonder if that's a sufficient explanation to undo rampage uh, events in the United States. And the other issue that always comes up is gun control, right? So if we just got rid of the guns, this wouldn't happen. When we look at the case of Alex, we see that that just isn't going to work either. Because in this case, Alex used two 8-inch kitchen knives. Knives that you have in your home that anyone in your home could pick up and bring to their school. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, I think the mental health system in the United States needs a lot of help. Um, not only because we don't have sufficient services. In the United States, we have fewer than 7,000 child psychiatrists. That just isn't enough. And even if we had enough practitioners, we don't have access. The pathway to getting mental health treatment is very bumpy because of issues of where to go, but also because of issues of stigma that are attached to mental health problems in this country. And again, don't get me wrong, I think gun control would be very, very useful in this case because it would reduce the carnage that could happen when these events take place. But it is not going to eliminate them. So I still think we need to ask the question of what happens that brings a sweet boy like this to end up looking like he did by the time that he was arrested, you know, with almost a demonic sense um, about him and, and a look in his eye. So I want to introduce the idea of thinking about communities uh, through a metaphor. And I want to use the metaphor of a safety net. Now, I have to tell you, this is a very funky safety net, right? This doesn't look like your usual circus net under a high-flyer high, uh, performance. But in fact, I want you to think about the, the tight person on the tightrope as you or somebody that you care about who is traveling on their life. And beneath them, they live in a community. And that community has two fundamental aspects that we need to think about. The first is that there is a level of integration that they experience. Their community either has love, care, or concern, or they don't. 
And having too little of that is dangerous, but also having too much of it is dangerous. In a similar fashion, we can think about the level of regulation. And the level of regulation, and this is the thing we don't often think about enough. The level of regulation is the amount of guidance, uh, the amount of oversight that we have. And together, these two things make up the kind of community that people live in. And as you look at that net, and you see it has this funky kind of structure to it, what we know is that if you live in a community that has a moderate level of integration and regulation, that is where you're going to have the greatest resilience when for whatever reason, loss, failure, disease, people fall off the, the safety net of their lives. And what happens is that we have poles that are pretty dangerous. So we have a pole where the norms of a society explode because of some event. And you can think of the Wall Street crash of 1929 or thinking about the Soviet Union, the fall of the Soviet Union as a situation in which there was a dramatic increase in the suicide rate. But you can also have too much of a good thing. And you can think about um, altruism as a kind of social structure as well, where people are so dedicated, whether we're thinking about suicide bombers or martyrs, that they give up their life for the community. Perhaps the oddest and most dramatic of these kinds of dangerous poles are ones that are characterized by fatalistic social structures. And fatalistic social structures in which the, the, uh, the coercion or the, the guidance sort of clenches up like a fist and becomes very coercive. And when we think about those 700 people who drank Kool-Aid in Jonestown, that is an example of a fatalistic social structure that pushed them to a negative end. And finally, uh, egoism, and this is when there isn't enough love, care, and concern. And in that case, people don't have enough uh, of a grab onto that safety net. And so we have two very dangerous situations that we encounter. A wall that shatters or ties that don't catch when you fall off the tightrope of your life. And our community will determine whether or not we survive or have resilience to those kinds of things. So what we miss, and I'd like to walk through this with uh, the case of the Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech incident that happened in 2007, is to introduce the concept of mattering. Everyone wants to matter. This is a classic sociological concept. And so what happens is when you are profoundly isolated in a tight-knit community, two discussions go through your head. The first discussion that you say to yourself is, I don't matter. The community has told me by rejecting me that I don't matter. And second of all, that because the community becomes this amorphous thing that you're not connected to, all of a sudden, none of you matter. The community doesn't matter. And that sets up a situation where the person who is now troubled by this sets up for a situation where they're gonna commit suicide or suicide by cop, and the target becomes an anonymous community and you get these rampage events. And we need to understand that rampage events are in fact unusual in the sense that they always involve a mass, a, uh, a mass attack at an anonymous community. When you're talking about a worker going in to, a, uh, to their workplace and targeting particular people, that's not a rampage, that has a very different character. So where does that leave us in terms of thinking about the idea of a social safety net and the connection between physical safety and social safety? Well, the first place is that um, it brings us back to this notion of the irony of place, where I was at my dermatologist's office not too long ago, and she rushed in and said she was very concerned because her three-year-old was going to school, and this was right after Sandy Hook. And that, without even thinking, I said to her, you don't have to worry, you're in New York City. And all of a sudden, everything stopped around. The, the nurses stopped prepping and the doctor looked shocked. But in fact, it has to be this combination of profound isolation in a place where um, a person is in a community that is tightly connected. And when we think about this, Bloomington becomes a great place to live. We consider ourselves a tight-knit tight community, but we have many places where individuals can go to matter if they do not fit that very narrow mold of high school that we all knew about. They can go to alternative schools. They can go to Indiana University, take classes early. They can go to many clubs and other kinds of things like Bloomington Playwrights. 
They can go to Harmony School. They can go to different high schools that have different strengths. And so the fundamental idea is to think about communities within a community, which is what New York City has in abundance, and which many of the places in which these things happened did not. And not to think about community as one thing. Because in places that have many communities, we have many pathways of mattering. And that's important because the story of this in the end is we are the problem. We have to find places for individuals who are different, who don't fit that narrow mold. So at the bottom line, while we are the problem, we are also the solution. Thank you. <laughs>